Industry experts say we're no longer on the verge of the personal computer revolution. We're right in the midst of it, thank you, and it's gathering steam with more and more people jumping aboard every day. The 80s was an incredible time for personal computing. In 1981, IBM released the first IBM PC, the 5150. It didn't follow the company's strict product development schedule and was based on standard computer parts. Without even realizing it, IBM created the PC market we know nowadays. A few years later, in 1983, Apple released Lisa, one of the first computers using a graphical user interface. It was an incredibly expensive machine and was quickly replaced a year after by the cheaper and faster Macintosh. While IBM and Apple were duking it out on who's going to get the biggest piece of the pie, a team coming out of Atari was working on a new piece of technology. A computer that was way more advanced than anything out there at that time. It had incredible sound and graphics, and it managed to immediately capture the imagination of creatives around the world. But it was a computer that would unfortunately fade away as fast as it appeared on the scene. What made the Amiga so unique? It was certainly a lot of things, but the main one has to be the different approach the team took when building the hardware. Instead of relying on the processor to do all the heavy lifting, they've built a series of chips that would handle tasks like video, audio, and graphics. Here's the motherboard from inside, and this is the 32-bit microprocessor. The smart design doesn't stop there, though. Here are some custom chips, specially designed chips. These two here handle the graphics and the animation, and this one handles just the sound. That approach not only freed up the processor to handle other tasks, but it also increased the capabilities of what the system can do in the video and audio department. The Amiga could display more colors than the competition, it offered four channels of audio, and it could also handle an incredible amount of graphic intensive operations like transparencies, sprite scaling, collision detection, etc. And it could do all those things at the same time without even breaking a sweat. Let's take as an example the Amiga 1000. It was released in 1985 and was way beyond what the competition could offer. In the highest ham mode, it could display 4096 colors at the same time. That's in stark contrast to the black and white pixels of the Macintosh and the 4 to 16 colors only high-end PCs could display. Things were equally impressive in the sound department. The Mac's single audio channel couldn't compare with the Amiga's highly programmable four channels of audio. And on the PC side, computers were limited to square wave sounds coming out of a really crappy speaker. It was mainly reserved to beeping sounds to indicate an error. That was years before any sound card became the norm for PCs. The difference in quality between these computers was quite staggering. The Amiga was also quite advanced on the software side too. Its OS supported preemptive multitasking, a feature that would come much later on both the PC and Mac. PCs got it with Windows 95 and the Mac with the first version of OS X. I vividly remember using Amiga's unique screen dragging feature, which was part of its multitasking feature set. On every application, you could just draw the screen down and you could have a look at the screen underneath, which was usually Workbench, Amiga's equivalent to the Finder. So if you wanted to do something else real quick, you could hide the application, complete your task on Workbench, and then carry on with the main task. On PCs, something like that wasn't even possible. These amazing abilities in hardware and software opened up a whole new world for both developers and users.
Amiga was the platform to own if you were interested in exploring what was possible creatively with computers. You could do music, graphics, of course play a ton of cool games, you could experiment with animation, video editing, it was all there ready for you to dive in. Amiga had a ton of graphics applications, from simple fractal generation utilities to advanced image editing tools. Deluxe Paint, for example, was the Photoshop before Photoshop. It was a very versatile tool that could not only do image editing, but also illustration work and animation. Deluxe Paint was heavily used in the gaming industry to create all sorts of assets, from title graphics to sprites and animations. And it wasn't just for Amiga-specific games, it was also used for PC and other platforms too. Wolfenstein and Doom's assets, for example, were produced in Deluxe Paint. Amiga was also the hub for 3D applications. Aladdin 4D, Imagine, Real 3D are just a few of the applications that come to mind. You probably won't know any of these since none of them have survived, but I'm sure you know the following two applications, Lightwave and Cinema 4D. Both of them started out on the Amiga. I actually still have the very first Cinema 4D version I ever used. It was version 2 and came with Amiga Format, one of the most prominent Amiga magazines in Europe. At the time I used all of these 3D applications, but I always came back to Cinema 4D. It was the application with the cleanest and most understandable interface, and the application I still use to this day. It's kinda wild if you think about it. Of course, the 3D capabilities of the hardware of the late 80s, early 90s cannot even come close to what's possible nowadays, but having the ability to experiment with 3D applications in such an early age was an amazing experience and a great introduction of what was about to come in the future. Let's take as an example the viewport. It was mainly represented with wireframes, and if you wanted to see how things would look, you had to go through the final render. Cinema 4D, for example, used scanline rendering. Scanline is exactly what you think it means. The computer would render out the image one line at a time. So, if you wanted to see how a specific part of the image would look like, you had to wait until the lines reached that point. As you can see, the 3D images back then had a lot of checkerboards, spheres, and abstract shapes, but in the hands of talented people, the 3D software of the time could do some really cool work. Let's take as an example the effects of the first season of Babylon 5. These were done with Lightwave and 24 Amigas, with 32 megabytes of memory each. 16 of them were used for rendering, and each frame took around 45 minutes to complete, which was a really good time considering the limitations of the hardware. By then, the competition had caught up with the Amiga, so the very next season the whole production was moved to PCs. But Amiga had a lot of hidden talents. Its ability to handle video signals directly made it a popular choice for TV stations and production studios. This was primarily through the use of the Video Toaster, a hardware and software solution developed by NewTek, the creators of Lightwave. Video Toaster turned the Amiga into a complete video editing, compositing, and effects system. Weather segments, for example, would use Amigas to overlay graphics to live footage, and the same goes for other non-weather related segments. They would use the Amiga for on-screen graphics, lower thirds, overlays, and transitions. The Amiga's popularity in the TV industry was partly due to its cost-effectiveness compared to other extremely expensive graphics workstations of the time. It provided professional-grade graphics capabilities at a fraction of the price. The Amiga was also loved in music production. The low cost and the ability to act as a controller for external instruments through MIDI made it a popular choice among musicians, composers, and producers. It was extremely easy to sample a sound, chop it up, and then trigger it through a press of a button. Amiga was always competing with Atari in this department, but technically the Amiga had the better sound. But the Atari was definitely used in some incredible hits of the time, like in Fatboy Slim's albums. One of the main ways to produce music on the Amiga was through trackers, and the most popular ones were Octomed and ProTracker. It was a very unique way to create music, and it's certainly an interface I haven't seen in any other music software since. 
Trackers would divide Amiga's four channels into four columns. Each row could trigger a node or a sample. A song would be made out of patterns, so you would first create the patterns and then stitch them together to a complete song. Even though it was just four channels of audio, artists could still do a whole lot of stuff with it. This is the Commodore Amiga. In there, you have everything. You have a sequencer that allows you to write notes as if they were on a stave. These rows are white notes from a keyboard. These rows are black notes from a keyboard. You literally figured it in your head and then programmed it straight in. And then, in order to get it going down, you put a pitch control in Octomed. If you take that digital output and put that to a big rig, it is as low as possible that a bass can go. Later on in the 90s, software developers found ways to extend the channels to 8 or even more, and also increase the bit depth to 16 bits or more. But even the 8-bit sound was enough to create some awesome music. Especially if channels were routed to external consoles where more effects could be applied, it was difficult to tell that the music was coming out of the Amiga. I have very fond memories of uh, playing around with both Octomed and ProTracker. Unfortunately, I've lost most of the stuff I've built with the Amiga, but thankfully there are a ton of songs out there from very talented musicians, so if you're interested, I'll have some links in the description below. We can't have a video about the Amiga without mentioning the amazing and vibrant demo scene. The philosophy around demos revolved around stunning audiovisual presentations, pushing the limits of what could be done with an Amiga. Talented programmers, artists, and musicians collaborated to create demos which often featured cool graphics, mind-bending animations, and cutting-edge soundtracks. It was amazing to see how much each team could fit into one floppy disk. And when the demo used two or more disks, you knew you were in for a treat. Or that the team did a bad job optimizing things. <laughs> one of the two. The Amiga demo scene fostered fierce competition among groups who were trying to outdo one another with increasingly sophisticated and technically impressive productions. These demos were distributed through bulletin boards and demo parties where enthusiasts would gather to showcase their latest creations. I used to have a ton of these demos and we would usually pass them around at school. It was a lot of fun to see all the crazy things people would come up with. Unfortunately, as amazing and powerful as Amiga was, the platform was constantly under some sort of threat. Even while it was being developed, the team had to constantly put down fires. When Amiga started running out of money, Dave Morris had to start looking for some. And uh, he ended up going back to Atari, where Jay Miner actually had some contacts. So they made a deal that uh, Atari would lend them $500,000 to keep going, they would use that money to actually make chips of the prototype chips that they had previously made. If they didn't pay back that loan by June 30th, 1984, it meant that Atari would get that technology for nothing. It was a deal out of necessity, but thankfully the team at the very last moment managed to partner up with Commodore and ensure its future. At least, the immediate one. But even then, series of bad management decisions made the advantage Amiga had quickly disappear. The company failed to capitalize on the initial success of the Amiga 1000 and didn't invest enough to research and development to keep up with the rapidly evolving technology. Even though the team had plans for even more powerful chipsets, Commodore didn't have a clear plan about what it wanted the platform to be. And at the same time, it didn't want to spend the money to market the product properly. So as things started heating up on the Mac and PC side, the Amiga development started slowing down. So the inevitable didn't take long to happen. With hardware sales slowing down, flagship Amiga software was quickly migrating to the more powerful hardware of the Mac and PC. 
I even remember reading an ad in an Amiga magazine about Cinema 4D moving to other platforms. They were describing how much faster the other systems were, and they even gave render times for specific scenes. The Macs and PCs of the mid-90s were several times faster than the best Amiga setup out there, so the writing was on the wall. After Commodore's bankruptcy, several attempts were made to save the Amiga brand, but they didn't lead anywhere. Escom bought the rights, but a short time after it also went bankrupt. Gateway was the next in line to buy the Amiga, but it ended up keeping the patents and selling the remaining assets to yet another company. After holding on to my Amiga 1200 and upgrading it with a hard disk, CD-ROM, CPU and memory, there was no escaping the fact that software was just not there anymore. As I started my studies in graphic design, I didn't have access to basic design software like Photoshop and Illustrator, so there was no way around it, I had to get a new machine. And that's when I got my very first iMac, the iMac DV. As happy as I was with my new computer, it was disappointing to let go of the Amiga, a platform that had so much potential but was let down by poor management decisions. It was the platform that introduced me to amazing 2D graphics applications, 3D, music, programming, and it was now gone. But thankfully, some of its software is still alive and kicking. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Follow the bouncing ball. Well, there you have it.